one of the um, largest group of species of wildlife of conservation concern across the, a, a great number of states are the young forest uh, dependent species. So scientifically, where would we be in today's world if we didn't cut, if we stopped cutting trees today? What would that do to the environment? From a scientific standpoint, the decision to not create a disturbance for wildlife that require disturbance is, is basically making a decision not to conserve a whole suite of species. We've, we've been managing our land by either chance, by letting the wind blow down, and not using good science. We've used, in a lot of cases, political science. How can you say no to a, a, a vast landscape of mature trees? It's beautiful. It's, it's aesthetically beautiful. It's the same. You hardly see a difference from one year to the next. It's just, you know, it's really nice. When we look at it, I look at it as at a forest and see you know, beautiful large trees, but the chestnut sided warbler needs a disturbed forest. It needs a patch of young, fast growing saplings and seedlings and shrubs. And so they, they you know, so I have to step back and think I need to look at it through the eyes of, of the wildlife that, that are, that, you know, that need the habitat. I don't know how many how many different ways we can say that it's a to do nothing is is just as much of a, a conscious decision as doing something, you know. Throughout the nineteen fifties, the nineteen sixties, the seventies, the amount of young forest growth across southern New England was in decline. But when we got into the 1980s, we seem to have hit a, a critical point where that amount of young forest growth was not enough to sustain some species of wildlife. Now we're at a point where our, our landscape is, is really, uh, really different because we've got um, cities and industrial areas and residential areas um, so the amount of forest on the, on the landscape is, is much um, smaller than it, than it was a few hundred years ago. We no longer have farms going out of business. We no longer have farms, old farmland regenerating into forests. We restrict uh, we, uh, where beavers can, can dam areas because we don't want our roads or our houses flooded out. We restrict uh, uh, forest fires because we don't want our property burned. Um, these are all legitimate, uh, you know, restrictions on on, on these uh, disturbance, uh, forest disturbance uh, causes. We don't have much say about where a tornado comes through, but um, uh, but often it's not where we want it, where, where we would want a disturbance, and so we're at the point where we need to create disturbances in the forest in a planned manner to sustain habitat for our, our wildlife. One of the best ways that we can do that is with timber harvests. And the timber harvest is a tool to remove mature trees to allow young trees to grow. Tonight we're exposing how the state agency that's supposed to be protecting our parks and forests is cashing in on cutting them down. Forester Dave Daphne says the only benefit that came from this clear cut at Savoy State Forest went to the loggers and the state, both cashed in on selling the wood. Is this protecting the forest? It's not. But they'll tell you that, but it's not. Why haven't environmental groups thrown up a big red flag to what's been happening? And towering canopies slashed into thousands of debris covered acres. So who's responsible for all of this? your government. This is what officials with the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation brag about when they claim their forestry practices are among the best in the nation. It does not look good. 
It looks like there are some problematic cuts, and it looks like DCR has a lot of work to do. This is what some call the Massachusetts Chainsaw Massacre. This is like a seven, yeah. seven, eight year old clear cut. Yeah. And the aspen came up fantastic in it. And this, um, this black cherry tree was left standing, and it tipped over, uh, in the, and it. And it makes a great drumming log for rough grouse. And so we've got a couple droppings here, a couple rough grouse droppings. We've got this one here, an older one, and a newer one here. And they'll use a, a grouse will come, a male grouse will come to it to the drumming log throughout the year, any time of year. But in the spring, um, especially in the spring, is when they do the majority of their of their drumming. It's their courtship activity, and uh, and so they'll they'll take up residence on the, they'll take up a position on this on this log and and actually make a, a tiny sonic boom uh, with their wings. Their wings aren't actually beating against their chest, they're beating against the air. And, uh, and uh, so this is where it takes place and this is an ideal, ideal drumming log. But uh, what's key about this is a grouse can be here and it can look all around and it can see through all these stems, but a predator can't come rushing at it through all these stems. So it's got that degree of protection and it can see very well. Um, so that's why this is an ideal spot. And, and who knows how long, how, much, how many more years this will be a good drumming site. I would suspect probably, you know, it could be a good five years, maybe more. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a real nice one right now. I think currently, meaning within the last year, we're going, we're starting to go in a positive direction because folks like uh, Audubon are recognizing we need to do this type of habitat management. And I think we're at the, the cusp of some really cool stuff once we get the education process. But the problem is going to be is there's so much state-owned land and conservation land can we educate the people enough so that they apply a little pressure to the politicians to allow this type of management that's what's really kind of holding us back but i'm always trying to be the optimist and i think we're going in the right direction i know 10 years ago or whenever it was when we met out here we were going in the wrong direction when they were trying to stop everything hopefully that was just a bump in the road and you know we're going the other direction. The results are that they cleaned up the log landing and it looks great. Yes. It provides habitat um, and the way the way they got regeneration here is fantastic. So the wildlife certainly, what in, in the human's point of view whether it was responsible or not, yeah. you know, was well, there was some controversy there but from the wildlife perspective certainly the young forest wildlife made out quite well. Yeah. There are some species of wildlife, some of the warblers, the uh, morning warbler, or the American woodcock, the New England cottontail um, rabbit, um, that require just young, uh, young forest growth. Grouse also, rough grouse also need that young forest growth, but that's not all they need. They, they, it's essential that they have mature forest as well. They'll use the mature forest in the wintertime as their food source. When, all, when the snow covers up everything that they normally would eat on the ground at other times of the year, they need to be up in the uh, feeding up in the canopy of mature trees um, where they'll feed on the buds of aspen, birch, black cherry, and, and a couple of others. All, all of our wildlife species on the landscape in viable populations requires us as stewards to cut timber, to cut trees, to regenerate patches of forest, to provide the habitat.
because it's not going to happen on its own for the most part. A big reason that, um, that just letting nature take its course doesn't, uh, doesn't work very well is because our forest is so much different today. It's less prone to a lot of the uh, natural disturbances that, that historically, prehistorically had um, made young forests, uh, wildfires, um, beaver, um, beaver activity, you know, beaver uh, flooding, um, shallow wetlands. Um, keeping common species common and keeping all, all of our wildlife species on the landscape in viable populations requires us as stewards to cut timber, to cut trees, to regenerate patches of forest to provide the habitat because it's not going to happen on its own for the most part. We can't rely on a tornado in the right place at the right time to knock down trees, to regenerate young uh, forest growth. We really need to plan our forest management to provide across the long term a, a balanced forest so that we'll have enough habitat for the species that need the young forest and we'll have enough for the species that need older forest and those species that need a mix of, of young and middle-aged and older forest their requirements will be met as well. A one acre clear cut is not enough of an area for a population for chestnut sided. You got to think a population needs to move in, not just one grouse or one chestnut sided. To, uh, to make young forest habitat, we're talking about uh, having about 10 to 15 percent of the land of the forested landscape in that young uh, young um, stage of forest growth at any one time. So, because we need all stages of, of forest growth, they we need we need the big trees, we need the old growth, we need uh, um, uh, kind of the middle-aged uh, pole stands of forest as well. Uh, but we need the right mix. The the species that do need that that young forest, we need to have that scattered across the landscape as well.